let's introduce our, our next uh, guest, which is Sarah Todd. Sarah Todd formerly covered the Sixers and has decided, and I don't know if it's a coincidence, Sarah, but all of a sudden you're out in Utah and you're now covering the best team out there. How you doing? You know, I keep, I'm doing pretty good. I keep telling people, you know, I covered the Warriors and they won a championship in 2015. And then I went to Philly and I was covering the Sixers and they went to that playoff round with the uh, Toronto Raptors. And now I'm covering the Jazz and they're the winningest team in the NBA right now. So maybe, maybe I'm just good luck. I think so. Now, if people, if you don't follow Sarah on Twitter, you have to follow her on her Twitter account. It is it is much more entertaining than just basketball, and it's got lots of great information. <laughs> but Sarah, earlier you tweeted something, and, and I now have to ask about it because it does relate to the Sixers. You retweeted mm-hmm. a story about Doc Rivers and a reporter deciding that he was going to do his interview from his bed laying down. Yeah, yeah. Is that the new yeah. reporting standard? Is there a protocol here? <laughs> you know, okay, here's what I'll say, because there are some reporters, I mean, we're doing everything via Zoom these days, and so um, who among us hasn't done a Zoom in our pajamas, is, uh, you know, but there are some that, you know, will do it laying on their bed or laying on the couch or at the gym or in their car and so people are doing these zoom calls from everywhere whether it's pre-game post-game practice day interviews with coaches players um and uh i i just thought it was funny because we have a we have a reporter here in utah that often often does that uh not me i am i am obviously incredibly professional i would never but <laughs> You would never do anything like that. I mean, you yeah. talk about the talent on the team that you're, you're covering. Jeff and I were having a conversation off air, um, just sort of looking at the, you know, we talk a lot about load management in this league and the Sixers have, and a lot of players miss a bunch of games. The Jazz, on the other hand, they roll out that same lineup for the majority of their games. Can you talk about uh, the players you're getting to cover out there and, and how they're handling the managing of those players throughout this difficult season. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because they're they're one of the few teams, first of all, that came into the season with a ton of continuity on the roster. I mean, really the only change that was made was Derek Favors being brought back from the Pelicans, but he'd already previously been in Utah for eight years. And so it wasn't like it was a new place, <clears throat> excuse me, or a new situation for him. Um, and outside of that, I mean, everything has stayed the same. And so then at that point, I I think that there, there's a little bit of thought that maybe, you know, things this season are, we're going to be weird for every team. There's, you know, you've got the pandemic, you've got the really tight schedule and the quick turnaround that we had from last season. And so there's a strong possibility that people were going to be in and out of the light up. And that's not even considering injuries that are going to happen through the course of the season anyways. And so I think that the coaching staff for the Jazz, they've thought, as long as our guys are available, let's use them because that might not be the case. And so they've been using the same eight, nine guys every day. Okay, well, you got to cover the Sixers through a period that we referred to as the process. Somehow the Utah, the Utah Jazz have been able to put together a roster that isn't just beating teams, but is beating them badly. What is the secret sauce that they have that they were able to do this without going through the, the dreaded process? Yeah, I mean, I think probably if I had the if I had the exact answer to that, that that if it was that easy to come up with the answer, then all the teams would be doing it, right? Um, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, though. Um, like I said, with the continuity of the roster from last season to this season, the Jazz have also had extreme continuity within the organization uh, for as long as we can all remember. I mean, they've had front office, coaching, ownership continuity. I mean, they just had an ownership switch uh, this year, but it was an incredibly like thoughtful and thought out process. And, you know, if you look at the Sixers, you did have, um, You know, Brett Brown was there, and he was given a lot of time to work with that team. But that roster changed so much during the time that he was there. And the front office issues and problems and turnover that they had with the Sixers while he was there was 
you know, massive. It was, it was like every day something was changing. And so I think that a lot of it has to do with like the program that the jazz has been running with over here hasn't changed. And so they've been given sort of the freedom to like really see this thing out. We talk a lot on the show about things that happen off the court and the way that athletes utilize their platforms. One of my issues I care a lot about is how athletes can sort of normalize mental health challenges. So I really enjoyed your your most recent piece about Keon Dooling and his journey now from NBA player to mental health advocate to Utah Jazz assistant. Uh, can you talk about that some? Because that's fascinating to me, the the mental side of sports and how athletes are starting to buy in more. And here you have an athlete who now is a coach that is working specifically with that as well. Yeah. For those that don't know, Keon Dooling, um, he played in Missouri, was, you know, a lottery pick in 2000, played about 12 years in the league. And um, he had completely repressed and blocked out um, sex abuse from his childhood. And it, in the off season, just before training camp, he had like a, com- a complete mental break because there was something that triggered those memories to come flooding back. And I mean, he started going through really extreme PTSD symptoms. He was having like paranoid delusions. He was, you know, sleep deprived. He was anxious and depressed and he completely spiraled and just, he quit playing basketball. He ended up in a psych ward and he'd never even told anybody about what had happened to him when he was young. And so then when he finally did, he, you know, started seeing a therapist and working with different types of mental health professionals and realized, like, I don't have to be alone with this and I don't have to feel this way. And it was a huge turning point in his life for him because then he he goes on to become like a certified life coach and a mental health advocate and then eventually the director of the um, National Basketball Players Association's mental health program. And so and he's a huge part about why every NBA team is now required to have a full-time mental health professional on staff at all times. But Keon is a huge part of that. And um, you know, as all this was happening, what he always wanted to be was a coach, but he all of this stuff happened to him throughout the course of his life. And so it pushed him sort of into the mental health world. And then the coaching opportunity came and, and now it's, I think it's just a really beautiful story because you have a guy that is really committed and invested in helping people, you know, live a healthy life. And I mean, emotionally and mentally healthy. And we need a lot more people like that who can be advocates for this and can try to push away the stigmas around mental health issues. And I mean, he's a great person for that and he's well respected throughout the league. And so it's it's really good for the NBA that he's in the coaching world now and that he brings that experience and that wisdom. You know, with the, with everything that's happened with the pandemic and the bubble, and we've had players talk about the, their issues with regard to with being in the bubble and mental health issues. What what have you noticed this season about, especially with the Utah Jazz, about how they're able to deal with all of these outside issues that weren't something that anybody anticipated? Are they finding different ways to deal with it than they dealt with it last season? I think that I know, and it it plays back into the Keon Dooling thing. I mean, they hired Keon Dooling, and one of the reasons that you know people love him is because he's such a good communicator, and that's been a really big thing with the Jazz is having communication be sort of a cornerstone of the coaching philosophy here. And uh, Quinn Snyder talks about it. The players talk about it all of the time, um, that everyone is really open. Um, and that goes back years. Uh, Joe Ingles, uh, who plays for the Jazz, uh, he has a son that is autistic. And um, when that diagnosis came, it, really, really impacted him and his family. And, you know, it's, that's a scary thing to happen when you don't really know anything about it. You don't know what to do. And um, Quinn Snyder uh, and the front office of the Utah Jazz were really supportive of him and they really truly cared about what happened. And they've made huge pushes to incorporate uh, awareness and training for um, 
people to understand autism and to uh, you know raise money for research programs and stuff and so there's a ton of communication and dialogue that happens and that openness i think makes everyone feel comfortable about coming to the coaches or coming to their teammates or anyone with their problems i think that's pretty unique in the nba um but i think that we are seeing sort of a shift where it is someday may not be as unique which is what we would hope for i did want to ask you before we let you go um i listened to the 30 for 30 about when everything shut down last year Frankly, I didn't realize how in the middle of it all you were. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about what that was like, the craziness of that time? If people haven't listened, it's, I mean, Sarah, your comments are very interesting on there and it's a fascinating piece. I'm, I'm just wondering if you could talk about what those challenges were like then and if you're doing okay now with it all. Yeah, it was a, that was a really weird night. I was, I was in Oklahoma City the night that Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID and um i mean it, it was just a really surreal thing to happen just watching the game being stalled and postponed and not knowing why but you know having sort of that sinking feeling because you know that week i think was when the coronavirus started to sort of come into our minds a little bit more it's hard to remember back when a time when you know we weren't wearing masks when there were still 20,000 people in the arena but that's what it was like that week and the only thing that we really knew about COVID is that we were hearing that people were dying. That's what was on the news. It's just people are dying. And so it, it felt like a death sentence. And, and obviously that's not to say that it hasn't been tragic, but you, know, you, you didn't hear about the people that were recovering or about how it was transmitted. And so yeah, if, eventually me and the two other reporters that travel with the team regularly, are you know down in the bowels of the arena we're waiting you know we're being told you know stay in the arena don't leave we don't know what's going on yet and we're scared because we're thinking are we going to get tested we know that the team's been quarantined in the locker room and then you know eventually we've got cdc and health department workers that are standing in front of us you know after we've been tested and telling us you know if, if you've been within five feet and having prolonged conversations with people you know you're at risk and so that's just describing a reporter's job and so we're like well we're definitely at risk then and that was on a wednesday night we were supposed to be back in utah on thursday and that friday morning my mother who had heart heart surgery last year was supposed to be flying into utah to come visit me and so you know we're, we're all scared we're sitting in the arena we're there for seven hours and uh i'm sobbing on the phone calling my mother telling her you have to cancel the trip because going through my head is like, I don't want to kill my mom. And so that's sort of like the, the depths of where it got to was I was thinking like, I don't want to be the cause of my mother dying. And then, you know, and looking back on it, like we were very lucky and very fortunate and I tested negative and I've been incredibly cautious and the, it's just, it's really strange now to think that that was almost a year ago and what we've all been through since then and how much more we know and how much we've learned and uh, how much more there is to do. It's, it's just been a wild year and it was a wild night for it to kind of start. Well, you were on the leading edge of everything shutting down and, uh, you know, we, we appreciate the coverage you're doing now and always uh, appreciate the time you give us and look forward to having you back on again soon and take care of yourself. Okay. No problem. Anytime guys.